This time on The Gadget Show. How to make money from your old gadgets. John and Susie face the challenge of getting the most cash possible from selling out-of-date tech. Retro television, £40. I get the first look at Nintendo's brand new handheld gaming console, the DSi, and ask, will it wipe out the competition? Oh! And Vic Reeves challenges us to build his ideal gadget, a smart shopping trolley. It does wait like an obedient fridge, doesn't it? Oh, <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> And welcome to The Gadget Show. Now, you might have noticed that something important is missing from the studio. Luckily, it's not the Game Boy in a silver hand. That's still there. Whew. No, it's actually more important than that. Uh, unfortunately, our lovely Susie Perry is not very well, and she can't make it to the studio today. So, get well, Suze. But don't worry, she's still in this week's programme in a challenge between her and John to see who can sell their old tech for the most amount of money. And trust me, you don't want to miss it in these credit crunch times. That's all later. Right now, I want to talk to you about a subject that's very close to my heart, handheld gaming. It's an area that has traditionally been the domain of Nintendo, first with their Game Boy, uh, after that the Game Boy Advance, and most recently the ubiquitous DS. But the DS, four years on, is about to be replaced by this, the DSi. Isn't it gorgeous? But the question on every gamer's lips is, is the DSi good enough to continue Nintendo's global domination of handheld gaming. Gaming on the go. Doesn't matter whether you're a school kid, a commuter, or a crazy tech geek, it's the thing to do. But which of the portable consoles available is the best? I've assembled three vying for the crown. First up, we have an exclusive look at Nintendo's DSi. It's not released till the 3rd of April, but we've had one specially shipped over from Japan. The first thing you notice is that the DSi is thinner than the DS Lite, and its screens are bigger. Three inches on the DS Lite, 3.25 inches on the DSi. Also, two 0.3 megapixel cameras have been added, one on the inside hinge and one on the outer shell. These allow you to personalise your DSi and will in time play games that are currently being developed that use facial recognition. The DSi's most obvious rival is the PSP 3000, the latest model in Sony PlayStation's portable range. I don't think it's possible for a portable gaming device to be any more gorgeous than this. Just look at that screen, 4.3 inches of LCD. It's sumptuous. It has Wi-Fi connectivity so that you can use your PSP as a web browser and you can also import your favourite pictures and audio tracks. The final contender is the new iPod Touch. Not a dedicated games console, but a multimedia player. With access to Apple's App Store, users can download a whole heap of gaming content over Wi-Fi. This has brought the iPod Touch into consideration as a serious mobile gaming device. And in no small part, that's down to the intuitive use of the accelerometer, the touch screen, and up to 32 gigs of internal memory. But what are these three like to play? Oh. I've been living and breathing them, spending hours button bashing, stylus punching oh. and screen swiping to scrutinise the overall gameplay experience of each. So let's begin with the DSi. The Nintendo gaming experience can be defined as quirky simplicity. I mean, I'm playing Mario Kart here, and I've, I've got to say, it sits perfectly with the physical characteristics of the DSi. It's so straightforward, and yet it's weirdly addictive. Clearly, the DSi is a fun machine, but can it satisfy the needs of a gaming enthusiast? To find out, I've been playing Call of Duty World at War. This is the perfect title with its complex content to test the metal of the DSi. With its improved processor, it does seem to be handling things very smoothly indeed. Graphically, however, the DSi is no improvement over the DS. It's still got 260,000 colours and an LCD screen, which in these conditions with direct sunlight is next to useless. For all of its improvements over the DS, the DSi is still a pretty simple and straightforward console. It doesn't do anything amazing graphically. The interface, I think, is good, but not earth-shatteringly good. What I am excited to find out about is what they're going to do with these two cameras. That could be really exciting. Next up, the Sony PSP 3000. The PSP has always been a really popular choice with gamers. It's got sweet graphics and a range of big title games. Two of my favourite titles, Tekken and Grand Theft Auto, more than display what the PSP is capable of. 
with 16 million colours and a contrast ratio that's five times superior to the previous PSP Slim, this PSP 3000 screen has the feeling of a high-definition television. The pixel response time has been halved in the 3000 series to reduce ghosting, and it's still easy to play outdoors thanks to built-in anti-reflective technology. With that gorgeous screen and the natural feel of the controls, this is a device that appeals to natural-born gamers. Finally, the outsider, Apple's iPod Touch. Anyone using the iPod Touch as a gaming device will find it a pleasurable experience. It has software that uses the accelerometer and touchscreen functionality in fantastically creative ways. The App Store is awash with affordable games. With simple graphics and controls, they're just a job for a spare five minutes. But now, well-known games developers are releasing Apple-friendly versions of their bestsellers. Brothers in Arms is one such title that has made it to the 3.5-inch touchscreen. The frame rate on this game isn't as high as I'd like it to be, and therefore it's not as smooth a gaming experience as I'd expected. But the touchscreen interface is fantastic, and it's that that draws you in and keeps you wanting to come back for more. And I reckon it's the iPod, not the DSi, that's the best of the bunch. This skinny little multimedia device is the new and unexpected hero of gaming. The way you download the games, the type of games that you play, the interface, the accelerometer, the touchscreen. This is the future of portable gaming. So what about G ratings? OK, three Gs for the PSP 3000, because it doesn't have the mass appeal of the other two, although I think it's a fantastic gaming experience. And the DSi? OK, four Gs. It falls short of the full gamut because the two cameras on the new device aren't yet exploited. When they are, who knows, it might be a 5G affair. I think I know where this is going, the iPod Touch. Well, you may not, because I'm going to give it 5Gs Ooh. as a gaming device, which is amazing. Just uh, the most beautiful gaming experience I can ever remember having uh, in Ooh. terms of the interface, the way you move it around, you blow on it, you, you, you shout at it, you touch the screen, but also the range of software and the way that it's so easy to download. Some of the most exotic and innovative gaming uh, I've ever experienced. Mmm, well, there we have it. The iPod Touch, the gadget show's handheld gaming device of choice. Welcome back. Now it's time for this week's challenge, which involves John, who's sat there, and uh, Susie Perry, of course, who isn't, because she's poorly. Get well soon, Susie. Yes, indeed. Now, in these troubled economic times, you never know when you might need to raise a bit of cash. And so we wanted to find out how much money you could get by selling some of your old tech. Yeah, apparently there is £23 billion worth of unused tech in homes around the UK that could be boxed up and sold for cash. But how do you go about doing it? That's exactly what we decided to find out in this week's challenge. We'd both been given a big pile of comparable tech made up of just the sort of stuff we all have lying around our homes and used. We each had an old telly, a pile of old mobiles, a stereo, an iPod, a camcorder, games consoles and a couple of digital cameras. Our challenge was very straightforward, to see who could sell their pile of old tech for the most money. But right from the start, we both had very different views about where to sell. Well, I think it has to be online, because you've got so many auction and trading sites, and you've got access to a, a worldwide market. John, it's a no-brainer. No, no, no. I still think there's a lot to be said for actually making a physical sale, especially second-hand, because people like to touch and feel what they're getting. With that, you can't beat the real world. So, with me only allowed to sell online, and John only allowed to sell in the real world, the contest began. Anyway, good luck, Mr Bentley. Good luck, Miss Perry. Yep, well, the challenge is on. Get shifted. See you later. With 12 gadgets to sell, we both had our work cut out. Of course, shifting stuff for a pittance would have been dead easy, but we wanted top dollar, and that meant good, honest, hard graft. With all my tech loaded into a van, I headed to the high street. Well, I headed for the world's number one online marketplace, eBay. eBay has over 40 million users in the UK alone, which means a quarter of the population could be potential buyers. But with 10 million items up for sale at any one time, getting big bucks for my tech was going to be all about selling the right stuff in the right way. But there are a few things that you can do to maximise your chances of making a sale. Rule one, make sure your photos are sharp, well lit and uncluttered. You want buyers to concentrate on what you're selling and nothing else. And be open about any defects. Photograph the scratches and dents and be honest about them. Then buyers won't think you're trying to hide something. 
Rule two, make your description as detailed as possible, as this is the most important element in convincing people to bid. And be creative. Imagine the kind of words that people type in when they are searching for an item. For example, this isn't just a camera. It's a Pentax, digital, 10 megapixel, five times optical zoom, waterproof, nearly new, original box camera. The more times that your listing is seen, the more chance you've got of selling it. Keep it informal and friendly and make sure you get the idea of bidding into their heads. Ask them to bid, tell them to bid, implore them to bid. Just make sure that they're thinking about bidding. Rule three, sell at the right time. Three or four day auctions are typical for your smaller stuff, seven to ten days for the bigger stuff. And you want your auction to end on either a Thursday lunchtime or a Sunday afternoon because statistically, those times do the best trade. Eventually, after being up on a three-day listing, I'd got £136 for my Pentax Optio camera and just over £50 for both my Sony camcorder and my Sony Cybershot. Result. Although I wasn't allowed to sell online, that didn't stop me also making use of eBay. This is Bid Online in Birmingham, and they're an eBay broker. There are stores like this all over the country. All you've got to do is walk in and drop off your tech, and they do the rest. Let's see what we can get for this. I had an Xbox and a PS1 to sell. PS1? Yeah, I, I know, it's older than you, but... Uh... <laughs> eBay brokers manage your whole eBay sale for you, and because they're a business, they know how to get you the best deal. Once the sale's completed, they'll send the buyer your goods and send you a cheque, taking 20% commission. My two games consoles netted me £19.20 after commission. You don't get all the money, but it requires practically zero effort. So I can get on with selling some of my other stuff. So which is best, selling direct on eBay or using a broker? Well, as a little experiment, we tried both methods, selling five items on eBay ourselves and then handing five identical items to an eBay broker. That's great. Each pair of gadgets had the same length auction and in every single case, the broker got a better price. So, that's one up to the high street. Although online, Susie was finding other options. eBay isn't the only auction site out there. CQ Ad is the second biggest in the UK. Launched in 1999, it has no initial listing fees and lower final sales charges than eBay, so you get to keep more of your money. However, CQ Out's payment system means that they hold on to the money, only releasing it to you once the buyers receive their goods. I sold my Panasonic Mini DV camcorder for £30 and a PS2 for £55. And now I am £85 richer. While Susie was becoming a virtual Dell boy, I went looking for second-hand stores. And one of the most prominent on the high street is Cash Converters. They bought over 400,000 items from people like you and me last year. So what can you do to squeeze as much cash as possible out of them? When you take your stuff in there, it'll be assessed by a specialist member of staff who'll take into account things like age, condition, and how much similar kit they've got already. If you've given your kit a bit of a spruce up before you go in and you've packed it in a way that makes it look as though it's been cared for, you should get a few extra quid. It's also worth including any accessories and original packing. That should help with the price too. I've got the uh, instructions and the USB cable and the manufacturer's original charger. It's also worth haggling, especially if you're taking in a whole load of stuff. Wait until they've given you the individual prices and then try and bump up the total. I mean, why don't we just hint for just a little bit more, really? We can see what we do, so yep. we get a second opinion. After a second opinion, I got an extra fiver. I'm pretty pleased with what I got in there. I've sold my camera and a couple of old mobile phones and walked away with 82 quid in cash. I was going great guns, but so it seemed was Susie, who was finding a whole host of places to offload her old tech online. Over the past 12 months, searches for second-hand stuff has gone up by 22%, which has given a massive boost to classified websites like Gumtree, and this one, pre-loved. These are websites where you list what you're selling for sale locally. They've seen nearly a 50% increase in traffic in the last 12 months. I decided to list my Apple laptop on there. It may have been over 10 years old, but I still reckoned I should be able to get up to £100 for it. Susie was doing well racking up the sales. I needed to get a move on. I need to turn my gadgets into cash and I need to do it quickly. So, next stop, a computer fair in Manchester. Computer fairs are like car boot sales for electronics, where you can pick up anything from laptops to blank CDs. 
They're regularly held in large venues all over the UK, attracting thousands of people who come looking for a bargain, both from regular traders and from private sellers like me. I got myself a stall for the day for some serious selling, but how could I maximise my returns? What everyone coming here is looking for is quality at the right price, so it's important to do your research to make sure you don't sell your stuff too cheaply, but at the same time, don't price yourself out of the market. Retro television, £40. Every home should have one. Combined with some shiny disco lights, my efforts on the megaphone seemed to do the trick. I was overwhelmed by people looking for bargains. 170 would be brilliant. Within half an hour, I'd sold both my iBook and Nikon Coolpix camera for £170 and my Panasonic camcorder for £38. Well, that was very interesting. There was a, a really quite intense initial rush and it now seems all my best stuff has gone. Um, and it's all gone very quiet. So time for some price reductions, I think. It's sale time. I didn't want to cart any of this stuff home with me, so whatever I got would be worth it. Slowly but surely, the items started to sell. It's generally recognised in law that by buying something second-hand, people are paying less for taking on the risk of buying an older product. Nothing like customer service. But just before I left, there was a final twist in the selling saga. Now, that's interesting. Just as we were packing up, the bloke who bought the iPod has actually brought it back because he's complaining there's no uh, mains adapter in the box. Now, normally, when you buy something second-hand privately, you don't really have many statutory rights. Two, though, do apply. The stuff the seller's selling has to be theirs to sell, and also it has to be as described. In this case, obviously, you'd had a good look at it first, but it does say on the box that it has a mains charger, so I decided to give him his money back. It seemed the right thing to do. Still, despite the return, I'd made a handsome £251 profit at the fair alone. The time was running out for both of us, and it was now a race to sell our remaining tech. At Shea Perry, it was time to shift some old mobiles. There's a number of online companies that will buy your old phones off you. Phone Bank, Gazelle, Bimitronics, Envirophone, to name a few. I got the best for my two phones on Phone Bank, and not to be sniffed at £20. Now it was time for the final push. Suzy's last two auctions were coming to an end, and to sell my last two gadgets, I was heading for CEX, a specialist electronics trade store. CEX was founded in 1992 to buy, sell and exchange electronic goods, and with stores in the UK, the US and Spain. It's quite an advanced system. How much for these, then? So they can offer a 12-month guarantee on resold goods, they submit any electronic equipment to a series of tests before they'll buy it. My iPod passed with flying colours, netting me £24. But transporting my old PS2 up and down the country had damaged the laser, and they wouldn't take it. Hmm. Still, I got £6.10 for the control pad and games, making my final sale just over 30 quid. While John had sold all that he could, I was left with my TV and hi-fi. I had high hopes at the start of the auction, but as time went on, the bidding eased up, and as is always the case, I had to sell to the highest bidder. But at least it brought in another £45.95. We were done, but who'd made the most cash? Well, I'd managed to raise £473 from my 10 days selling online. And I'd got £382.10. 90 quid less than Susie. Oh, 90 quid down. I am sorry, because you were hammered, John. <laughs> that is quite a big win by Susie, isn't it? It is, I yep. did find uh, some of her techniques for eBay very informative, especially yep. selling on a Thursday and a Sunday. Yeah, but all this eBay strategizing, you know, is all very well, but if you actually need cash now, you can walk into those shops and come out with it in your hand in minutes. That is a really good point, but nevertheless, you lost the first part of the challenge. I, you know, I'm sorry yep. to rub it in, yes. uh, but don't worry, you've got a chance to excel yourself, as later on in the programme, Susie and John are going to use the money they made from selling their old kit uh, to make some interesting purchases of new kit. That's later on in the programme. Up next, though, it's the Wall of Fame. <laughs> Each week on the Wall of Fame, we're looking at one particular area of gadgetry and choosing the most iconic gadget in that category to join our Wall of Fame. This time around, it's me versus Otis. We're both choosing a gadget that we present our case, we do a quick pitch to John, and then he is the judge. Now, obviously, I'm stood in for Susie as she's not well, and she's left me with a daunting record to keep up. The iPod and the VHS, both on the Wall of Fame, are hers. Right, gentlemen, down to business. This week, it's all about cameras, and it's the Polaroid versus the Box Brownie. 
This is the box brownie. Now, it may be over 100 years old, but it was the original people's camera. And because it was the first camera to bring photography to the masses, I believe it has earned its place on the Gadget Show Wall of Fame. It was launched in 1900 by George Eastman's Kodak Company. Eastman was determined to bring photography within the reach of everyone. Up until then, the cheapest camera available would cost most people over a week's wages. He devised an incredibly simple camera made of tough cardboard on a wood frame and covered in imitation leather. With a simple lens and an even simpler rotary shutter, the box brownie went on sale for five shillings, about a hundred times cheaper than anything else on the market. Right, it's a splendid new century, Britain rules the world, look happy. Marvellous. The name came from cartoon characters called the Brownies, as Eastman felt the name would appeal to children. But he soon found that his cheap, reliable cameras were actually being bought in their millions by grown-ups. Box Brownies of one shape or another continue to be made, bought and used for the next 70 years. There have been 125 different models and I can guarantee that at some point, someone in your family owned a camera like this. The Box Brownie was the first camera that brought photography to all of us. For all its 70 years and many incarnations, it was very affordable, very reliable and above all, beautifully simple to use. It has to go on the wall of fame. Of course, if you're talking truly instant photography, you've got to talk about the Polaroid. I mean, look at this thing. It's beautiful. It absolutely deserves a place on the Gadget Show Wall of Fame. Designed in 1948, a full 50 years before digital cameras, it provided instant photographs. OK, you look really happy because World War II's just finished, but also look a bit sad because your nan's a spy and she's in a Japanese prisoner war camp. All right. The Polaroid was invented by Dr Edwin Land after his daughter complained that it would be weeks before they could see their holiday snaps. A few years later, he was demonstrating it to the world. Perfect. They only made 57 of these originally. They all sold out on the first day of demonstration. One, two, three. The genius of Polaroid cameras has always been in the film. The whole developing process takes place on the print itself. As the photo is taken, chemicals on the actual print are activated, and one minute later, hey presto! Originally, the chemicals were stored in a pod which was split as the film advanced. You then waited 60 seconds and pulled the two sections apart. From 1972, though, the whole developing process happened outside once the film had been pulled from the camera. In the 60 years or so since it was invented, 200 million Polaroid cameras have been sold. At its height, at any given time, more than 100 Polaroid pictures were developing in hands around the world. Just play with your hair a little bit. That's it, flick it out. Oh, that's the money shot right there. Now, as well as being the ultimate party gadget, the Polaroid was also used by professional photographers to take a quick snap before they went for the proper 35mm shot. And policemen used it as a cheap and effective way of taking ID shots. Oh, fantastic. Look, if you ever think about doing glamour work, that's my card, all right. These days, the traditional Polaroid has been superseded by digital cameras. But the fact remains that the ability to instantly see each and every photo you took totally transformed the way we thought about photography. Oh, and shaking your Polaroid doesn't help you to develop it more quickly. Sorry. Right, gentlemen, both fascinating pictures, but uh, as ever, one has to make a choice. And, uh, I mean, Otis, I mean, it's just an antique, that, isn't it? Is it really a gadget? It's a small sort of leather trinket. <laughs> Of course it's a gadget. <laughs> Within the first year of release, these sold 150,000 units. It's the camera that gave millions of people the chance to capture memories forever. Good point. And Jason, a spectacular piece of equipment. But the pictures, frankly, they're often a bit of a disappointment. The colours could be awful. They faded no! away. <laughs> I love the Polaroid aesthetic. I mean, it's the sort of thing now that you'd spend hundreds of quids on software to reproduce. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Ah, but the decision, the decision. I mean, as ever, they both deserve a place, really, on the Wall of Fame. They're both tremendously important cameras. But I've got to choose between the one and the other. Ooh, the Polaroid, the Brownie, the Brownie. I think popularity has to win the day. It's got to be Otis's box. No! Brownie. Yes! Thank you very much. Because it did revolutionise <laughs> photography. It just made it affordable for people. They sold millions of them. It lasted for, <laughs> lasted for 50 Ooh. or 60 years as a brand. I mean, it's just such an amazing success, an amazing, groundbreaking product. Welcome back. Now, it's time for another top five. The top five flasks.
OK, I know, not the sexiest gadgets on earth, but on a freezing day with no kettle for a hundred miles around, a hot drink can indeed be a thing of beauty. Everybody needs a flask. The question is, which one to choose? Well, that's what you're about to find out. Here I've got a range of 15 flasks, but which are best equipped to satisfy your hot drink needs on a day out in the country? To find out, I've devised a couple of tests, starting with how well they retain heat. For this, I filled each of our flasks with coffee, ensuring their contents were piping 80 degrees centigrade before tightly securing the lids. Next, I took the flasks outside to leave them exposed to the elements for a gruelling 24 hours. And here they are. They're a little wet and windswept, but it's time to check the all-important temperature of the coffee inside. Vacuum flasks like these have a narrow gap between the inner and outer walls, which is evacuated of air and helps prevent heat loss by convection and conduction. They also have a reflective layer on the inside, which helps prevent heat loss by radiation. Because of their low conductivity, glass or stainless steel is used for the inner walls. However, all flasks will leak heat over time, mostly through the plastic stopper and lids. To scrutinise the flask's individual performances, I recorded the temperature of their contents. And only the five flasks with the hottest coffee inside will progress to the next stage. OK, we now know that these five will keep your hot drinks hot, even on the most epic of outdoor trips. But how do they compare in terms of taste and ease of use? Time to find out. All five had successfully preserved a fresh coffee taste, so the final order of the top five would depend on heat retention, usability and features. At five is the Aladdin Aveo. The Aladdin's got a minimalist, smooth, sort of stainless steel finish. It feels well finished. Not sure the uh, cup's that appetising a drinking vessel, though. It's got one of those caps that you can half take off, which uh, makes it easier to pour. It also helps keep the heat in. And it's a fairly clean pourer. At four is the Thermos Everyday 100. I think this is a more successful example of the smooth stainless steel style. It's uh, very good looking indeed. And when you open the insulated cup, you get an automatic stopper. So with this flap shut, no coffee comes out. But when you want a drink, just flip it up and pour. At three is the Thermos Floating Flask. I like its tough, shock-resistant plastic case, which makes it uh, resistant to uh, bumps and dents. And I'm intrigued by the fact that it floats, which would make it ideal if you like a cup of tea with your angling or boating activities. A two is the Stanley Bolt. This bolt goes some way to solving what, for me, has always been a problem with flasks. You fill them up, you get in the car, you put them in the footwell or the boot, and they just roll around. But this doesn't, because it has this bolt shape, which helps steady it. It also holds the heat well. It's a nice piece of design, and I like it. And at number one is the Aladdin Challenger, which was top dog in the heat retention stakes. Now, one of the reasons for its excellent heat retention may be the fact that it's got a double cup at the top, which I think is an excellent feature in a flask. I mean, it's great for when you're out with... Uh, friends and it's also got a secret compartment in the bottom which you could use for sugar or indeed for two different types of tea bag mm. it's good it's a really good cup you can actually make your drinks the night before now it's great stuff okay now uh, you may already know this but in uh, three weeks time we're doing something called the gadget show live it's an exhibition at the nec in birmingham and if you're sitting there now smugglishly brandishing your tickets Good for you. But if not, you might like to know you can win them in this week's Gadget Show competition. Yes, indeed you might, because this week we're giving away four pairs of tickets to Gadget Show Live, including tickets to the Super Theatre, where Uslot put on a performance of the Gadget Show like you've never seen it before, and transport to the show and back home again. Yeah, and this week, because we're feeling particularly generous, uh, we're also going to give four of you the chance to win 50, yes, 5-0 gadgets. So that's four winners, all getting 50 new gadgets and tickets to Gadget Show Live. It's brilliant. And here's the full list of everything you could win. Read by him. A 15-inch plasma TV, a 32-inch LCD TV and an in-focus DLP projector, a high-def Blu-ray player and 15 Blu-ray movies, a MacBook laptop, an Apple iPod Touch, an Epson photo printer, a Nintendo Wii, a Wii Fit and a DSi as soon as possible after launch, 
a Microsoft Xbox 360 and a couple of games for each of the consoles, a Panasonic compact digital camera, a high-def Sony camcorder, a Sony reader, and a Surefire torch, a bulletproof USB memory stick, a pair of Skullcandy headphones and a Gorilla Pod, a Berghaus rucksack, a Yogi Gatekeeper Pico, a Magimix food processor and an Oral-B Triumph electric toothbrush, a Flip Video Ultra and a Pure Dab Radio, a Pocket Surfer, a year's free subscription to Sky's Full HD service plus Dish and Decoder, and a year's free broadband at the very best speed we can reasonably get where you live, an appropriate Wi-Fi router to go with that, and £50 worth of calls a month free for a whole year on the free network and a Sony Ericsson Cybershot mobile phone. Altogether, it's a prize fund worth nearly £30,000. And to be with a chance of winning, you'll need to know the answer to this question. In which movie did Tom Cruise's character memorably use the phrase, show me the money? Was it A, Jerry Maguire, B, Days of Thunder, or C, Rain Man? To enter, call 0904 161655 or text A, B or C to 6355. Calls cost £1.50 from a BT landline. Calls from other networks may vary and from mobiles will cost considerably more. Text cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. For rules, go to 5.tv slash win. Lines close at midday on Monday, March the 30th. And of course, we'll show you the question again at the end of the show. Good luck. Now it's time to return to this week's challenge. You remember from earlier on the show, Susie and John were set the task of selling their second-hand gadgets. Susie could only use online means, whereas John could use everything else except online to make as much money as possible. Susie won quite impressively, raising the figure of £473, as opposed to John, who only managed to raise £382.10. So, Susie won that one. They now move to the second and final part of the challenge, where they use the money they've made to buy the best computer and TV they can find. Our mission was to buy the very best TV and computer or laptop that we could with our winnings. But where do you go and what do you look for? Well, back on the road, I was on the hunt for a cheap telly. I tried wanted ads, the local paper even, but then I got to thinking about a more focused search. Now, when the TV leaves its manufacturer, it goes to any of the sort of places where you normally expect to buy a new TV, the uh, high street shops, the online retailers, the catalogue sellers and so on. But the shelf life of a TV model is short. New models soon supersede old ones. And any of the old ones that remain unsold are quickly shuffled off to the rental market or to TV wholesalers, even though they're still new and in pristine condition. Some wholesalers, like this one in Birmingham, are open to the public. You can find anything from ex-rental to brand new unsold TVs here at up to half price. They range from shiny new plasmas to chunky old CRTs, known manufacturers to generic screens with random branding. If a TV doesn't sell here, then it's exported, say to Africa or the Middle East. So a place like this could be your last chance to pick up a bargain telly before it leaves the country. Meanwhile, Susie was at home Googling for cheap tellies and found sites like Be Direct and Pixmania, which were up to 18% cheaper than shop prices. This TV here is X-Display, so it's probably just been sitting in the showroom for a while, but it can't technically be sold as brand new. So it looks like some fantastic deals on here, but you can't go jumping in and take it at face value. You really need to do your research. The best thing to do is check out the archived reviews on sites like Trusted Reviews or CNET to see if the telly you're after is worth a punt. With the TV search well underway, we also had to find the best computer we could. My search took me to a big retail unit on the outskirts of Birmingham. This is Speedy Computers and they operate a pilot scheme due to be rolled out across the UK soon. Under this they collect old computers, refurbish them and then sell them again at knockdown prices. Most of this lot came from Birmingham City Council, but they also collect from private homes. Up to 4,000 machines a week have their hard drives wiped to Ministry of Defence standards. They even have a massive hard drive shredder to destroy data permanently. But I'm here because they take in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laptops. They sell laptops from £90, although there's a wide range of different specifications available. I'm taken by this uh, HP at £180 with a dual-core processor, a gigabyte of RAM and a fingerprint reader. As they take in so many machines, their stock changes constantly. But places like this are always worth checking out. I was frantically searching for the best deal I could find. But with computers, it's so hard to get the spec you want for the price you want. Then I had a brainwave. 
With the rise of the second-hand computer trade and all this reconditioning and refurbishment, there are now loads of second-hand computer parts out there for not very much money. Using a mix of new and reconditioned, I could get parts for a top-notch computer. While Susie searched for hard drives, processors and the like, I was close to buying. But what did we go for in the end? Wow, impressive stuff. Thank you. Can I start with your collection? Yes, indeed. Uh, OK, first of all, this does the job. It's 32 inches, you can't mess with that. It's got a, a DVI input at the back. It's just... A, it's not in a great state of repair. It's a little bit ugly. However, the laptop rocks! Really, really nice computer. Yep. Susie's computer also, I've got to say, very impressive. <laughs> I particularly would have gone for her strategy of buying components because I like, I like to More do that. More labour-intensive, eh? Yeah, very Again. much labour-intensive, yep. and also um, not something that actually everyone can do. We now move on to the TV. It's a definite winner. I mean, mm. look at it. It's a beautiful TV. Yep, yep. And I note at the back, it's got a DVI and a separate HDMI. It's a multi-usable machine. Obviously, the superior package is Susie's, but it should be. She had 90 quid more to spend. And I, yeah. I feel that actually because of the quality of the laptop that you managed to find, I'm going to call this part of the, the challenge a draw. Ah. However, Thank you. <laughs> it's not all good news because Susie won the first part of the challenge, which means that this week in our budget challenge, yep. Susie is the overall winner. I think that's a fair result. But I think the thing to take away from this is that you're better off doing your trading online than face to face. Welcome back. Now it's time for another top five. The top five flasks. OK, I know, not the sexiest gadgets on earth, but on a freezing day with no kettle for a hundred miles around, a hot drink can indeed be a thing of beauty. Everybody needs a flask. The question is, which one to choose? Well, that's what you're about to find out. Here I've got a range of 15 flasks, but which are best equipped to satisfy your hot drink needs on a day out in the country? To find out, I've devised a couple of tests, starting with how well they retain heat. For this, I filled each of our flasks with coffee, ensuring their contents were a piping 80 degrees centigrade before tightly securing the lids. Next, I took the flasks outside to leave them exposed to the elements for a gruelling 24 hours. And here they are. They're a little wet and windswept, but it's time to check the all-important temperature of the coffee inside. Vacuum flasks like these have a narrow gap between the inner and outer walls, which is evacuated of air and helps prevent heat loss by convection and conduction. They also have a reflective layer on the inside, which helps prevent heat loss by radiation. Because of their low conductivity, glass or stainless steel is used for the inner walls. However, all flasks will leak heat over time, mostly through the plastic stopper and lids. To scrutinise the flasks' individual performances, I recorded the temperature of their contents. Mm. And only the five flasks with the hottest coffee inside will progress to the next stage. OK, we now know that these five will keep your hot drinks hot, even on the most epic of outdoor trips. But how do they compare in terms of taste and ease of use? Time to find out. All five had successfully preserved a fresh coffee taste, so the final order of the top five would depend on heat retention, usability and features. At five is the Aladdin Aveo. The Aladdin's got a minimalist, smooth, sort of stainless steel finish. It feels well finished. Not sure the uh, cup's that appetising a drinking vessel, though. It's got one of those caps that you can half take off, which uh, makes it easier to pour. It also helps keep the heat in. And it's a fairly clean pourer. At four is the Thermos Everyday 100. I think this is a more successful example of the smooth stainless steel style. It's uh, very good looking indeed. And when you open the insulated cup, you get an automatic stopper. So with this flap shut, no coffee comes out. But when you want to drink, just flip it up and pour. At three is the Thermos Floating Flask. I like its tough, shock-resistant plastic case, which makes it uh, resistant to uh, bumps and dents. And I'm intrigued by the fact that it floats, which would make it ideal if you like a cup of tea with your angling or boating activities. A two is the Stanley Bolt. This bolt goes some way to solving what, for me, has always been a problem with flasks. You fill them up, you get in the car, you put them in the footwell or the boot, and they just roll around. 
but this doesn't because it has this bolt shape which helps steady it. It also holds the heat well. It's a nice piece of design and I like it. And at number one is the Aladdin Challenger, which was top dog in the heat retention stakes. Now, one of the reasons for its excellent heat retention may be the fact that it's got a double cup at the top, which I think is an excellent feature in a flask. I mean, it's great for when you're out with uh, friends. And it's also got a secret compartment in the bottom, which you could use for sugar or, indeed, for two different types of tea bag. Mm. It's good. It's a really good cup. You can actually make your drinks the night before now. It's great stuff. Now it's time to return to this week's challenge. You remember from earlier on the show, Susie and John were set the task of selling their second-hand gadgets. Susie could only use online means, whereas John could use everything else except online to make as much money as possible. Susie won quite impressively, raising the figure of £473, as opposed to John, who only managed to raise £382.10. So, Susie won that one. They now move to the second and final part of the challenge, where they use the money they've made to buy the best computer and TV they can find. Our mission was to buy the very best TV and computer or laptop that we could with our winnings. But where do you go and what do you look for? Well, back on the road, I was on the hunt for a cheap telly. I tried wanted ads, the local paper even, but then I got to thinking about a more focused search. Now, when a TV leaves its manufacturer, it goes to any of the sort of places where you normally expect to buy a new TV, the uh, high street shops, the online retailers, the catalogue sellers and so on. But the shelf life of a TV model is short. New models soon supersede old ones. And any of the old ones that remain unsold are quickly shuffled off to the rental market or to TV wholesalers, even though they're still new and in pristine condition. Some wholesalers, like this one in Birmingham, are open to the public. You can find anything from ex-rental to brand new unsold TVs here at up to half price. They range from shiny new plasmas to chunky old CRTs, known manufacturers to generic screens with random branding. If a TV doesn't sell here, then it's exported, say, to Africa or the Middle East. So a place like this could be your last chance to pick up a bargain telly before it leaves the country. <laughs> Meanwhile, Susie was at home Googling for cheap tellies and found sites like Be Direct and Pixmania, which were up to 18% cheaper than shop prices. This TV here is X-Display, so it's probably just been sitting in the showroom for a while, but it can't technically be sold as brand new. So it looks like some fantastic deals on here, but you can't go jumping in and take it at face value. You really need to do your research. The best thing to do is check out the archived reviews on sites like Trusted Reviews or CNET to see if the telly you're after is worth a punt. With the TV search well underway, we also had to find the best computer we could. My search took me to a big retail unit on the outskirts of Birmingham. This is Speedy Computers, and they operate a pilot scheme due to be rolled out across the UK soon. Under this, they collect old computers, refurbish them, and then sell them again at knockdown prices. Most of this lot came from Birmingham City Council, but they also collect from private homes. Up to 4,000 machines a week have their hard drives wiped to Ministry of Defence standards. They even have a massive hard drive shredder to destroy data permanently. But I'm here because they take in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laptops. They sell laptops from £90, although there's a wide range of different specifications available. I'm taken by this uh, HP at £180 with uh, dual-core processor, a gigabyte of RAM and a fingerprint reader. As they take in so many machines, their stock changes constantly. But places like this are always worth checking out. I was frantically searching for the best deal I could find. But with computers, it's so hard to get the spec you want for the price you want. Then I had a brainwave. With the rise of the second-hand computer trade and all this reconditioning and refurbishment, there are now loads of second-hand computer parts out there for not very much money. Using a mix of new and reconditioned, I could get parts for a top-notch computer while Susie searched for hard drives, processors and the like, I was close to buying. But what did we go for in the end? Wow, impressive stuff. Thank you. Can I start with your collection? Yes, indeed. Uh, OK, first of all, this does the job. It's 32 inches, you can't mess with that. It's got a, a DVI input at the back. It's just... A, it's not in a great state of repair. It's a little bit ugly. However, the laptop 
rocks. Really, really nice computer. Yep. Susie's computer, also, I've got to say, very impressive. <laughs> I particularly would have gone for her strategy of buying components because I like, I like to like More labour-intensive, though. Yeah, very Again. much labour-intensive, yep. and also um, not something that actually everyone can do. We now move on to the TV. It's a definite winner. I mean, mm. look at it. It's a beautiful TV. Yep, yep. And I note at the back, it's got a DVI and a separate HDMI. It's a multi-usable machine. Obviously, the superior package is Susie's, but it should be. She had 90 quid more to spend. And I, yeah. I feel that actually because of the quality of the laptop that you managed to find, I'm going to call this part of the, the challenge a draw. Ah. However, Thank you. <laughs> it's not all good news because Susie won the first part of the challenge, which means that this week in our budget challenge, yeah. Susie is the overall winner. I think that's a fair result. But I think the thing to take away from this is that you're better off doing your trading online than face to face. Welcome back. Now, as you might know, we've got a bit of a history here on The Gadget Show of building our own gadgets, but we're not beyond accepting ideas from other people, and so it was that we sent a letter inviting Vic Reeves, gadget fan that he is, to come up with his very own crazy invention. Hello, Gadget Show. I'm Vic Reeves, and here's my informal challenge for you. When I go out shopping, I take one of these with me. It's a shopping trolley on wheels with a walking stick that I pull or push using my hands. I want a shopping trolley where my hands are free. So, my challenge to you is to invent a remote control shopping trolley. This is what I'm hoping it might look like. There's the shopper and there's the trolley full of goods that's following him. And also, there's some pipes at each corner so you can put flowers, an umbrella, a newspaper, walking stick or indeed a rifle. So there's my challenge to you. I do hope you come up trumps and me being the kind of can-do guy that I am I sent Otis to go and make it for him I'd never done anything like this before but I was determined to step up to Vic's challenge first I had to go shopping for components okay so this is what I've got two basic components the radio control truck which will provide the drive mechanism and the steering for our basket and the granny cart, which is essentially the body and the wheels for Mr. Reeves' robo trolley. I could use the motor of the car to power the wheels of the cart and turn my cart into a remote control racer, but that was just the beginning. But I don't want to control the trolley, I want the trolley to control itself. Making the trolley follow me automatically would be the really tricky bit, so to help me out, I recruited Ed and Paul, two engineers from the University of Bath. OK, fellas, what's been suggested here by Mr Vic Reeves is that the basket and the shopper both have magnets. But I'm thinking, when the trolley gets too close to the shopper, they're just going to stick together, and you don't really want to walk around the supermarket with a trolley stuck to your butt, yeah, right? Yeah, I can't see that working. Well, you've got cans of beans flying off the shelf after the magnet. That could be hazardous as well. I think if we use uh, infrared transmitters, um, put a transmitter on Vic, that can send out infrared pulses uh, the trolley can then receive them and tell what direction he's in. In fact, we used four receivers, one on each side so the trolley could tell exactly where the signal was coming from. We had to build a circuit to convert the infrared signal into drive for the wheels, and Paul had to design some custom software. The infrared transmitter sends out regular signals which are picked up by the sensors. The closer the sensors are to the transmitter, the stronger the signal. This software here checks each sensor's position in relation to the transmitter and tells the motors to drive or steer accordingly. When the software was complete, we sent it to the trolley's microprocessor via a Bluetooth receiver. Then finally, after hours of graft, our creation was ready. So we'd done it. We'd actually built a follow me trolley. But would it work well enough to impress Vic? Hello, Otis. Hello, Mr. Reeves. This is it. This, this is, is the it. trolley. This is your remote control trolley. It looks a little bit like you're being followed by a fridge. Well, it's your design. Will it follow me? It will follow you. All you need to do is wear this special transmitter belt. Right. And then wherever you go, it shall follow. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, he's following me. <laughs> oh, it's really quite creepy. Vic had prepared us a slalom to test the trolley's manoeuvrability. So I'm wandering about the supermarket in a carefree manner. Whoa! <laughs> Follow me. This is the future of shopping, isn't it's not it? not bad, is it? I'm liking it. Let's take this scenario. I'm at the checkout. Oh, I forgot some beans! Before the trolley could respond, Vic was out of range. Ah. So what it then does is it obediently waits for you until you've got the beans, you haven't lost your place in the queue. It does wait like an obedient fridge, doesn't it? Oh! 
Stone, I love you too. <laughs> but the real test was still to come. Could our trolley cope with the winding aisles of a busy supermarket? Right, what should we have for tea then? Smash. All right, yeah. Smash and jam. Good start, Nat. Yeah. Easy fried onions. I like the sound of that. Yeah. It was working beautifully. Brilliant. Here we are so far. It's magic. But as we neared the freezer aisle, our trolley was confused. The shiny surfaces were reflecting the infrared. So we're in an aisle now that has, it's got less shininess. So it should follow you with less difficulty. We're doing all right, aren't we? Not too badly. If only I needed a pair of tights. <laughs> Are you happy? I'm very happy. I think I put a lid on it to stop me shopping getting wet on the way home. Yes. I might use those pipes as rocket launchers. Good idea. But other than that, I think it's a prototype. It's fantastic. That was great. A very good start, I think. I've got it on here. Give it a can go. I, can yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I assembled it right. You... Yep, and you've plugged it oh, in. Hang on, I have, because it's working. It's already touching. There's my transmitter. That's right. So back. let the trolley see your transmitter. OK. Oh, it's working. There you go. Do some hang shopping. On. I've got some, yeah, I've got some, <laughs> just some gadgets, little sling box in there. I want to move carefully. There's a little pure radio that I found. I'll run that, mate. This way. It's, isn't it brilliant? Yeah. In this studio, it works much better, actually. It does, because there are less shiny surfaces to confuse the sensors. This is good. I'm going to play with this, look. Uh, I'll see you next time on The Gadget Show. Bye-bye. This way. It actually turns really well. <laughs>